rock of ages. I'm Jacob Rabinowitz, and welcome to my first video on Java. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the bubble sort. Which they tell you about pretty soon after you've been introduced to arrays. So let's make ourselves an array of integers. Let's call it nums because it's going to have nothing in it but numbers. And let's give it some content. Ninety-nine, negative ten, one hundred thousand, one hundred and twenty-three, and. 18. We're also going to find it useful to have a couple of variables, so let's make some of them. T, A, and B. E. Let's make a copy of our array down here in the left hand corner. 99, negative 10. 100,123, 18, and let's mark off for reference the indices 0, 1, 2, 3. All right, then, what we want to do with bubble sort is we want to take the items in our array from 99, 99 negative 10. 100,123 and 18, and we want to put them in ascending order from lowest value to highest value. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use this if statement. If nums at index 2 is greater than nums array at index 3. If that condition is fulfilled, then we're going to execute the following code. Variable t is going to be charged with the value of nums2. Then nums2 is going to be overwritten with the value of nums array index 3. And finally, nums array index 3 is going to be overwritten with the value we stored in t. And let's close our curly brace because that's the end of this block of code. Let's see how this actually plays out. We begin by looking at our condition. If nums2, that means the value in index 2 of our array down here, 
if NUMS index 2, that's 100,123, is greater than the value in NUMS array index 3, that's this one, 18. And that condition is indeed fulfilled. So NUMS index 2 is greater in value than NUMS index 3. Then we may take the following steps. First, we take variable t and we invest that with the value in NUMS array index 2. So t now is worth 100,123. Then we overwrite the value of NUMS index 2 with the value in NUMS index 3. So let's overwrite it. Index 2 now is evaluated at 18. And then we're going to take the value in NUMS 3 and we're going to overwrite that with the value we stored in T. That's 100,123. So we successfully ordered here the values in index 2 and index 3 in ascending order. A very impressive accomplishment. We did that by a kind of a shell game hiding one value in variable t over here while we made our switcheroo. And although that may seem a little bit elaborate, in the course of this video, we're going to go over this again and again and again. So it's going to become very, 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 very clear to you and very, very easily understood. So this is great so far as it goes. But this piece of code, this if statement, only makes the rearrangement for the values in index 2 and index 3. What we want to do is we want to reorder this array all the way down the array for every single index, for every single entry. In order to accomplish that, we're going to need to add something else. We just saw that we can, using an if statement, We can evaluate and switch the values stored at the various indices in the array. Now we're going to need to add a for loop. to take us down the array. All right, back to our code. First off, we need to put in the parentheses which should originally have been here on my if statement. And you'll note that I've restored the array down here to its pristine form. The code we have here enables us to compare and switch the values at two places in the array. What we want to do is make our comparisons and, if necessary, switches all the way down the array. In order to do that, we're going to need a more abstract and flexible way of referring to the places. And that's this, the for loop using our variable b. Let's say for beginning at value b equals 3, continuing until b is no longer greater than 0, and each time through decreasing the value of b by 1. Now we're going to want to make the rest of our code consistent with the variable that we've introduced. 
So it's going to be if nums b minus 1 is greater than nums b, t is going to be set to the value of b minus 1, and then nums b minus 1 will take the value of b, and nums b will be set to the value of t. All right, let's see how that actually plays out. For b equals 3, that's where we start off. If b equals 3 is greater than b equals 0, that's certainly a condition fulfilled. We can proceed into our if statement. If the value stored at index b minus 1, if b equals 3, then b minus 1 is going to be 2. So if, if the value stored in index 2 is greater than the value stored in index 3, index b, that is, if 100,123 is greater than 18, that condition is indeed fulfilled. Then, we're going to take the value in index b minus 1, that is to say, index 2. We're going to store that in variable t. t equals 100,123. We're going to overwrite the value in b minus 1 with the value in b. And then we're going to overwrite the value in b, which is 3, with the value we stored in t, which is 100,123. The if statement is concluded, which kicks us back upstairs to our for loop. At this point, the b has been decremented from 3 to 2. So, let's see how that affects our execution. We're going to continue with this for loop so long as b is greater than 0. b evaluated at 2 is still greater than 0. So, if the value at b minus 1, now that means 2 minus 1, that is to say 1, over here. If negative 10 is greater than the value stored at b, which is 2, so if negative 10 is greater than 18, that condition is not fulfilled. Negative 10 is smaller than 18. Since the condition of the if statement is not fulfilled, we don't do anything else. We're kicked back upstairs to our for loop, and at this point, b has been once again decremented, this time from 2 to 1. The value of b, when b equals 1, is still greater than 0, so we can proceed. Now, if the value at b minus 1, that's 1 minus 1, which will give us index 0. If the value at index 0 is greater then the value at index b, which is index 1. If 99 is greater than negative 10, which indeed it is, our condition is fulfilled for the if statement, and we can proceed. We're going to store the value in b minus 1, that is 1 minus 1, which is index 0. We're going to store its value here in t, so t is now worth 99. We're going to take the value in b minus 1, and we're going to overwrite it with the value in 1. So that becomes worth negative 10. Then we're going to take the value in index 1, and we're going to overwrite it with what we stored in t. That is 99. We've gone through all the code in our if statement. We're kicked back upstairs to our for loop. At this point, the value of b has been decremented to 0. This condition, b is greater than 0, is no longer fulfilled. b is equal to 0, so we can't go any further with this. We've exhausted the potential of our for loop. We can no longer execute this code. 
Let's see what we've accomplished. This description is the payoff, the effect of our if statement. Moved by our for loop all the way down the array was to compare index values two by two always being sure that the lowest value found so far ended up on the left. The result of this passing of the lowest value so far found from hand to hand ever leftwards was to place the lowest value in the whole array in the leftmost place. What we'd like to do now is put the second to lowest value in the second to leftmost place, and so on until the entire array was put in order. And to do that, we're going to need another for loop. What we're going to do now is add a second for loop, which will repeat the process. The if statement does the evaluation and switching, the initial for loop with variable b takes us down the array once. Now we're going to get a second for loop, which will, well, loop the loop, which will keep taking us down the array over and over. All right, we have added a second for loop with a. And we've made a change in the initial for loop, the for loop with b. This used to say we would continue with this for loop so long as b was greater than zero. And what that meant was that we would continue down the array from b equals three to b equals two to b equals one, but that's as far as we got. When we got to index one, we couldn't go any further because the next decrement down meant that b was going to be equal to zero and there b was no longer greater than zero. So this loop only took us as far down as index one, but we didn't need to go any further because of this code here in the if statement. With this, if nums b minus one is greater than nums b, that meant that from the vantage point of b, of this particular b, b equals one, we could overreach ourselves into b minus one, into index zero. So from this vantage point, we could reach to the end. Now that we've made this change here, what does it really change for us? Well, we're only going to go as far down as the point where b is greater than or equal to a. If a is 1, that means we're only going to go to the point where the value of b is greater than or equal to 1. Again, we're going to stop short here at index 1. And using this piece of code, nums b minus 1, we'll overreach ourselves from our present position down to the left-hand end of the array. So nothing's really changed So on the first iteration when we make this alteration in the b loop, but you're going to see it makes a remarkable difference as we make further iterations. All right, I have restored the array to its original form so you can see how it gets ordered every step of the way using our present loops. We begin with for a equals one. So the initial value of a is one. We'll continue so long as a is less than four, one is less than four, so we can proceed. Then for the b loop, for b equals three. All right, b is now evaluated at three. We will continue so long as b is greater than or equal to a. 3 is greater than or equal to 1. So we can continue into the if statement. If nums b minus 1 is greater than nums b, this is nums b minus 1, this is nums b, this is greater, we, we'll execute the code of the if statement. We store the value of b minus 1 in t, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. We overwrite b minus 1 with the value in b. And then we overwrite b with the value we stored in t. 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. 
We completed the code in the if statement. We're kicked back upstairs to the for loop. The b has been decremented in value. Now b is equal to 2. 2 is still greater than 1. So b is still greater than a. This condition has been fulfilled. We may proceed to the if statement. If nums b minus 1. If b is 2, b minus 1 is 1. So if the value of index at index 1 is greater than the value of index 2, it is not. Negative 10 is actually less than 18. We can't execute this if statement. We're kicked back upstairs to our for loop. At this point, b has been decremented to 1 for a situation where b is equal to 1. Is b still greater than or equal to a, which is also equal to 1? Yeah. 1 is still greater than or equal to 1, so we proceed. If b minus 1, from, from the viewpoint of index 1, that's where we are, b equals 1, is b minus 1 greater than the value in b? It is. 99 is greater than negative 10. So we store the value in b minus 1 in our variable. We overwrite the value in b minus 1 with the value in b. And we overwrite the value in b with the number we stored in the t variable, which is 99. All right, we completed the if statement. We're kicked back upstairs to the for loop. At this point, b has been decremented to 0. We've got to ask ourselves, is b still greater than or equal to a? Is 0 greater than or equal to a? It is not. We went as far as we could with this for loop. We're kicked back upstairs to the preceding for loop. And a has been incremented to 2. However, even at 2, a is still less than 4. So the condition is met. We can proceed from the a for loop to the next to the b for loop. All right. Now, at this point, since we begin anew, we take it from the top of this for loop. We start off with the initial value of b, which is 3. We ask ourselves, is b greater than or equal to a? Is 3 greater than or equal to 2? It absolutely is. So we may proceed with our for loop. If nums b minus 1 is greater than nums b, if is 18 greater than 100,123, it is not. We can't execute this if, if code. We're kicked back upstairs to the for loop. At this point, b has been decremented to 2. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, is b still greater than or equal to a? Is 2 still greater than or equal to 2? It is. So we may proceed. If b minus 1, that is to say, the value in index 1. If b is 2, that b minus 1 is, is 1. So if the value in index 1, in b minus 1, is greater than the value in index 2, then we we're ready to take certain steps. We store the value in b minus 1 in the t variable. We overwrite b minus 1 with the value that we have in b. And then we overwrite b with the value we stored in the t variable. At this point, b is equal to 1 because we finished the, the if statement. We got kicked back upstairs to our for loop. B was decremented. Can we continue? Well, we can only continue so long as B is greater than or equal to A, but 1 is not greater than or equal to 2. So that's as far down as we could go. Now, this is well worth noting. Previously, when we went down the array, we got as far as index 1, and overreaching ourselves with this piece of code, b minus 1, we could make that final switch. At this point, 
because of the increasing value of A, we can only go down as far as index 2. But we don't need to go any further down because the smallest value has already been passed from hand to hand down to the end of the array. So this much is already exactly in order. We only need to put the second lowest value down leftwards. And to do that, we needn't go further than the second than than the second to last place. The lowest value is already in the in the first place. The second lowest value is going to go in the second place. So that's what we did with this. Now, the reason this is so extremely clever is that we only go as far as we need to and we're not using memory to put things in order which are already in order. Now, it may seem like a trivial difference when you've got an array with only four items, but if you have an array with 4,000 items, then not having to go to the very end of the array every single time is going to save you a lot of memory. All right, then, let us continue. We couldn't go any further with this for loop. That kicks us back upstairs. At this point, A has been incremented to 3. However, 3 is still less than 4, so the, this condition has been fulfilled, and we can proceed with our B loop. Every time we begin it anew, we begin with the initialization value, which in this case is 3. We ask ourselves, is B still greater than or equal to, to A? Is 3 greater than or equal to 3? Yes, it is. So we can proceed with the if statement. Is the value in B minus 1 greater than the value in B? It is not. We can't do anything more with this if statement. We're kicked back up to the for loop. The for loop has been decremented by 1. So now B equals 2. At this point, we've got to ask ourselves, is B still greater than or equal to A? At, at 2, it is not greater than or equal to A. We can't go any further, but we don't need to go any further because these two have already been ordered correctly. So we made whatever rearrangement was necessary, as it turns out, none at all, for the value in this index. So we went as far down as we needed to. All right then, we can't go any further with this for loop. Let's go back to the top for loop. At this point, A has been incremented again, and now A is equal to 4. We look at our statement. Is A still less than 4? It is not. We can't go any further in this for loop, but we've gone as far as we need to because at this point, after 1, 2, 3 iterations, every one of the 4 numbers in our array has been put in correct ascending order. Now we've seen that when we're looping our way down through the array, we have to be sure that our starting point is the second from the furthest index on the right. Now, when you've got a four variable array, it's easy enough to count them, but what if you have a great big array? Well, in that case, we're going to use the instance variable length. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace this specific count here. Let's make ourselves some room. We're going to carry on with the first for loop for as long as a is less than, well, we really need some more room here. Nums dot length and increments of one. Now here's some nice verbiage for you. 
because arrays are implemented as objects, they can have associated with them instance variables of this sort. The, uh, the length instance variable, which is dot operated right onto the name of the array. And this automatically calculates the size of the array. And we need to make ourselves a bit of room in the B loop as well, since that also requires a modification. The B loop is going to now begin like this for B equals nums dot length minus one so long as B is greater than or equal to A and B minus minus. What th this means is if the array is a thousand, a thousand indices long, we're going to start off at B equals 999. The reason for that is that the array begins counting from 0 rather than from 1. So nums length gives us the actual number of items in the array. Like in this array down here at the bottom, we've got four items. But the indices are from 0 to 3. So the nums length for this array, the one we used for our example, would be 4. And nums length minus 1, that's the index we start at. The b value we're going to start with would have to be 3. If the length is 4, the furthest right-hand index will be 3 because the array counts from 0 rather than from 1. All right, now that we've added this refinement by replacing a, um, a count by hand with the instance variable dot length. Our work is done. We have a perfect program. Here's how our program looks in the NetBeans IDE. You can see it's got all its standard code. Um, in this case we've used a somewhat larger array, but we've used the same basic principle. I think this one has 10 members. And we've added a few bells and whistles. We're going to print out the size of the original array so you can compare it. And then here's our loop over here. That's the, um, that's the work we did. And at the end of it, we have instructions to print out the array when it's been uh, completely put in order. Let's see what it looks like. Does our program work? And yes, it does. We've got our original array and our sorted array right below it. And for those of you who like reading code, here's the main body of our program. OK, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for viewing.
that boy. 